You're listening to the Psychic Coffee Shop Podcast Network. Psychic Coffee Shops, the Mountain Bears edition. And uh, Mason, with me, of course, is Techie Joe. How are you, darling? I'm doing great. How are you this evening? Oh, totally evil and aggravated, but that's normal. Oh, <laughs> that is. It is. It is. It uh. is. Mercury's in retrograde. We've had some lovely freaking weather. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. LA right. Hey, we managed to play. Hey, we I managed know we did. Last that was fine, fun. okay? Though I felt really bad for yeah. a friend of ours that I asked him, because he was uh, like, what were you guys doing last night? And I was like, we went to fireworks. It was great. La, 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 la. And I'm like, how were your fireworks? And he was like, it was pouring rain. They canceled them. I was like, right. oh. That was just sad. Like, All right. Uh, but he lives near D.C., so I was glad to find out that that's the same weather that D.C. had. Yay! All right. Exactly. It had pouring rain. Of course, we didn't watch the parade. Um, oh, I saw no. a lovely comic earlier of uh, McCain turning on the faucet to pour down on D.C. Yeah. I thought that was hilarious. I can turn it on and off whenever I want to. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Like, just revenge. Gotta love it. Always a wonderful thing. But, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> it is. It's great. Uh, the pictures were horrible, and, yeah. Yeah, and there, there were also some, some articles where... Um, the the staffers had basically said they were just kind of praying for rain so they would have something to blame the poor turnout on. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, nationalism is fun. Not really. Well, yeah, you know. How well, it's the thing that you know. It gets to the point that it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It does. It does. In fact, oh, yes. I don't know. It's yeah, just... Know. It, it's been a crazy week. It really has. Yeah, it has. It has. It's been <laughs> insane. I can't, you know... the, You know, people don't understand the earthquake thing that it actually hit Vegas and L.A., <laughs> No mentions of it in the news, other than, you know, small pieces here and there. It's like, can we get some good damn coverage? Um, is it bad that I have to listen to CNN and know what's going on in my country because we got a reality star as president? Um, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Well, you know, it, it, that's pretty much where it's going to be, though, is that Unfortunately, we have merged politics and the Kardashians. Mm-hmm. Well, it's more like I'd even take the Kardashians, but you know. Well, yeah, yeah I'd take yeah, the Kardashians. That, would, that wouldn't even be bad. At least it'd be interesting. Right. You know, the, and 
like they might actually make some money off the sex tape. Well, I think they've made billions off the sex tape. That's not the problem. Um, the problem is, you know, we've got Iran ready to go to war. Um, yes. We've got, in general, you know, someone apparently thinks that we took airports over during the Revolutionary War. That makes me scared for our educational system if they're te- not teaching them when the plane was created. Well, now, hold on. What I find interesting about that was was someone else's commentary on the topic, um, and I just kind of breezed through that article uh, earlier, but it did make like the glaring point was nice front and center on it, is that the problem isn't so much that Trump doesn't know this. Mm-hmm. It's he's reading a speech written by someone on his staff who mm-hmm. does not know that. All right. And he's reading through that and not even not even caring. Not even caring. All right. I that's just really that's that's very sad. You would think most of the time like and that leaves me wondering, is, is there literally a staffer in the White House, a, a speechwriter for Trump who is that mentally defective? Because, I'm sorry, airplanes, revolutionary war, you've missed some history there. That, that's, that's not just, you know, being a little right. unaware. That, that's, that's mental defectiveness. Um, right. You know, hi, welcome. Um, but no, is there legitimately a staffer who does not know this? Or is there a staffer who very much knows this and is just kind of, Seeing how much humiliation he can pile in, or she right. can pile in through his speeches, um, you know, I, I, like if it's the latter, I applaud them. I, I do applaud them, um, though I think that would probably be the reaction more so of I. I just don't even care if I get fired now. Right. Like not even caring, just not even gonna. Um, but you know that that it's it's it is it's interesting it is weird it, it is a crazy time to live in right. <sighs> very crazy time very unusual time um just looking yeah. at everything from a water's perspective you know we've got the British getting ready to well, they've already pissed off Iran. They're getting ready to go to war with Iran. we got the French standing up to Iran. And our HMC is like, oh, well, let's make friends. Can we be friends? Well, yeah, probably to sell guns. I mean, there's nothing the NRA loves more than selling guns to people. You know, they will back all the wars. Mm-hmm. Like, let's just have a war a day. Um, but then you also look at Trump's cabinet. And or, or you know, uh, all of the department heads, every single one of them uh, would effectively benefit um, mm-hmm. from from war. Period. But um, none of them are minded in a way um, right. in which they're looking for peace or ways to generate peace. They're just looking to generate sales. You know, right. <laughs> Defense contractors and Boeing executives have no place at that table. Um, not right. from a advisory capacity. Um, right. You know, of course, you know, and, and that's not a hatred of Boeing. It isn't. I appreciate Boeing. I think Boeing's a wonderful right. company. But, um, right. you know, it's no secret that, you know, Commercial and you know regular uh, airline um, usage of planes, you buy one every so many decades, and that's basically it. You you run it till it dies, and you buy another one. Um, right. You know, so it, it, it's a product that that really can't have a lot of planned obsolescence. Um, you really don't want those just kind of being like your car that just 
dies, um, you, right. or a washing machine or whatever, um, you really need it, you know, to last. Um, so right. the their their best form of planned obsolescence is you know a uh, uh, missile or a bomb yeah. or you know things like that. Aircraft carriers are wonderful for that. Um, right. You know, blow them out of the skies, and at that point, sell another one. Um, you right. know, Boeing makes a lot of money off of that, and they would be lying to say they don't. Um, right. So when you have someone in that capacity, um, in an advisory capacity at least, um, that you know worked for the company, probably still works for the company at least on a lobbyist stand uh, or uh, sideline. Yeah, it's no wonder we're we've been looking at. I'm this presidency has looked for war from day one. Um, anywhere right. they can get it. Um, and I think ultimately it's going to end up being a war on multiple fronts unless we can get him out of there. And even if we do, there's still a possibility um, that the tensions are already too high. It's going to happen. All right. You know, there, there's more than likely no unscrewing the pooch. No, there's no unscrewing but, the pooch. There's no unscrewing a lot of things going on. Mm-hmm. You know, and this has been a problem country. It's like North Korea is a problem country. Now, granted, go back right. 200 years ago, we'd have a new colony called North Korea, called Korea. We'd have a new colony called um, Iran by now. Yeah. We'd already be Our working on the airports. Not a, exactly. You know, our founding fathers wouldn't have put up with this. The British community wouldn't have put up with this. I don't know where, somewhere around World War One, we all started not colonizing and not going, oh, we won this territory. You can pay your taxes now. Now people want well, to get into battle with us so that we'll upgrade their country. Well, to some degree, yes. Um, that, that, and that has long been a problem with war. Um, right. You know, it, it's that it, it kind of became the social obligation to, okay, if you're going to occupy us, um, you know, mm-hmm. after you bombed us, um, you know, you can either stop the fighting by, you know, stopping the fighting and then rebuilding, or this is just going to continue because you, you destroyed us economically, functionally destroyed us. Um, so what else do we have to do? You know, keep the munitions plant going and keep firing bullets. Um, right. And so it does become an issue is that, that the rebuild has less to do with an actual, and I hate to put it that way, it's not really even about like, you know, making people whole again, um, it's almost entirely about, like, this is how you have to exit a war now. Um, and a lot right. of that has to do with the the accessibility of continued fighting. Um, mm-hmm. One, we're not just fighting wars on the ground and on the air and the sea um, anymore. We are, you know, now fighting those a lot in digital spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, telecommunications is now one of the biggest things to, that you have to knock out um, in order to actually keep a war from being an entirely digital space event. Um, right. Because realistically, you the U.S. can out you know gun out man out whatever, but there's an for a very well set up. Um, group of hackers um, the right. US is a prime target we have way right. too many legacy systems we have way too little security um, you know a lot of this was not designed um, <laughs> it, it was designed for operations electronically it was not designed for security electronically um, right. you know like Originally, more than likely, the thought being, who cares about a water plant or a sewage plant or a, you know, whatever, it's not that big a deal. 
Except now it is. Mm-hmm. Well, now it is because that's how we're nice about it. Okay. Not sure I follow that. 300 years ago, you blow up the castle. You don't build it back for them better than it was. Well, but in, in in but we have learned from history that when you fail um, to fully assimilate a people or, or to mm-hmm. repair that area, the, it, it's the war is just going to keep going. Yeah, you know, it, mm-hmm. it's just going to keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, mm-hmm. You know, again. Is the the thought and theory is if you can get people made whole back to work and you know being productive members of society, they are less likely to hold back grudge. Right. Um, instead of you know what else do they have to lose? You know you can fight this right. war for a hundred years. Well, but, yeah, you can fight the war for a hundred years, or you can take it over. Sorry. Well, true. You know, looking at, you know, we got Flint, Michigan, mm-hmm. who doesn't have safe water to drink, but Iraq does. They have a totally brand new functional water system throughout their whole country. We built it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When children are drinking um, eight times the lead. And 25% of this lovely country of ours Mm -hmm. that has in Flint, Michigan's water, you know, schools are having to provide them bottled water because the water isn't safe to drink. Why are we, Mm -hmm. you know, building this and building that for places that aren't? Well, effectively, that's not a military function. And I think that's ultimately where we ended up after, um, you know, so much of the idiot's pregnant, uh, uh, presidency and eight mm-hmm. years of obstructionism is that mm-hmm. um, the only things that got through Congress for eight years or, or passed as bills and as ideas um, were things that were going to be military um, awards. Um, in right. terms of you know financial budgetary awards um, and allotments, so you end up with a lot going into peacekeeping and a lot going into other you know forms of military, most likely things that people can be privately paid for, and then you turn around and look at the actual United States, and no, it, it was a continuous no, 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 no. No, 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 on mm-hmm. anything that was needed domestically. And right. with and and then on top of that, we have had a lot of hack and slash um done to social support programs. Generally there is a screwed up uh theory right now, um, and it has been screwed up for a very long time, is that um the harder you make it on people, the more that they will want to work and get ahead. The ultimate problem with that being um, we have had severe unemployment. We are we, – we have a lot of deficiencies in this country as it comes to child care, um, uh, ah, pregnancy leave, um, caring for elders, you name it, if there's – a care or a concern that needs to be had there. We don't do that. We create a lot right. of hazards for people that even if they're not totally down and out, you know, like if even if you have this group of, of people that want to work, they can't even afford right. to work because they can't right. get to work. You know, it, it, it's mm-hmm. we used to joke about the concept that, you know, we we were seeing the job listings that, you know, wanted you to have five years experience for an entry level position. So you have to work to get experience to get a job that should be entry level. How does that ever work out? Who do you hire for this? 
you right. know, and then what happens to the next college or to this college graduate and the next college graduate um, right. if ultimately you're not going to hire inexperienced people to work in a position that is supposed to be entry level. At what point do you realize that it, from from a job market perspective, this is not reasonable, this is not rational, right. um, and this doesn't work? And ultimately, out of that, as you end up with a problem um, that, as you keep sliding down, you know, the ladders of success, you do okay. eventually hit a point in which I don't think employers are logically, reasonably understanding that what they're offering for some of these positions, um, the the requirements to work there far exceed the pay. That if right. you've got to go, you know, if you have to have this certification and this training and this thing and a background check and a this and a that, and a that it's not that any of those items specifically um, are – necessarily impossible but if you're throwing them off onto the employee mm-hmm. and then it's a part time position for minimum wage at some point one would have assumed the employer would stop and ask is this reasonable can mm-hmm. I demand the like? can I reasonably expect to put this position out on the market and get anyone right. to, to apply for it um, but yet they're going to sit there and complain about it, that, oh, we can't find anyone to work here. No, you can't. No one wants to work for you. Like, right. I can't afford, you know, as I've pointed out to some people, um, because they didn't realize they were doing it, um, you you are literally paying to work there at some point um, for some positions that if you don't like right. what the employer's doing, and I don't even know if it's an intent by the employer to create a position that effectively you pay to work there, um, or if it's just a complete inability to do simple back-of-envelope math. Because it's not hard math. Mm-hmm. Right. You know. <laughs> um, and, and we've uh, I know we we have had that discussion. Um, I don't know if we've necessarily done it on the show, but you know, while I was uh, uh, had a caregiver coming in for my grandmother, we were you know she kept kind of mentioning the fact that she was struggling, and you know she really couldn't understand why. And then over time, she's dropping little bits and pieces of information about the you know two jobs she has in addition to coming in to help with my grandmother and I'm sitting there realizing that on one of them specifically it's like you know okay you're being asked to drive from here to here and that's like 50 miles each way and there's two trips through a toll booth because this is up and down 77 you have to go through that toll booth at Jet and you know twice um, to, right. to take a patient that she's caring for to and from a doctor's appointment, and they're not going to reimburse her for any of that. Like, they're not going to pay for the tolls, not going to pay her for mileage, and, you know, none of it. Like, totally disinterested, not going to pay you. All right. And I'm like, wait a minute, how much do you make per hour here? You know, not to be rude and all up in your business, but how much are you making per hour? Because it's not that the gas and and the the tolls totally killed the situation, but it's sitting there realizing that if you're being asked to do this multiple times a month, you're putting you know mileage on that car. You're mm-hmm. having to get an oil change sooner than you would. You're having to buy tires sooner than you would. And at some point, it's going to get to, and it did for her, and that's kind of where the conversation started, is all that car maintenance caught up with her, is, you know, all of it, you know, she needed brakes, she needed tires, she needed an oil change, she had just gotten an oil change, it felt like, you know, and then the car had a few years on it, so it's starting to have other issues, 
And every right. time she turned around, cars back in the shop. And it's like, uh huh. <laughs> yeah, do some math. You're every, mm-hmm. you know, if you were being paid mileage for this, you would have had that money, you know, if if you were smart about it and set it to the side and for literally mm-hmm. its intent, which is mileage, set that money to the side, you would have had the money right now to put brakes on the car and to put, you know, Meanwhile, she's struggling some days to actually make it to work. All right. You know, it's like, would love to come over, but I only got $10 still payday. And I can't right. afford to do the double run. Gotcha. Right. Gotcha. Like, yeah, I understand. Um, yeah. But no, and that's the literal place we're putting people at is, and a lot of that has to do with employers who are not paying attention to what they're asking for or how they're setting up positions that, you know, or the, how this whole, looking at well, yeah, well, I mean, a lot of this is, you know, shooting my own career in the foot here for a second, but there's a lot of things that computer can, system can tell you. Uh, about mm-hmm. your peak hours and how many employees you need, when, and blah, blah, blah. What it doesn't tell mm-hmm. you is what that does to the employee and mm-hmm. what that eventually costs them. That if you're taking someone who is needing full-time employment, you know, as most people do, and you're working them you know, part-time hours, but you're not even being consistent, you know, it's two hours this day, maybe, if you need them, but you'll send them home early if you don't, and then you'll call them back in if you decide later you need them. You know. No one has time for that. No one has money for right. that. No one has the ability to handle that, um, because, right. especially if you're trying to juggle child care and you're trying to juggle the expenses of going to and from work. You know, if you right. live 30 minutes away from work, and they drop you for an hour, um, you know, told you to go home, and then you get home and you no more than walk through the door and they call you and say, oh, yeah, you got to come back in. Um, you know, we're going to need you, at, you know, uh, for the 5 o'clock now. What? Some people end up spending more than they make just getting to and from work in that situation. But – as an employer, you're not going to acknowledge it. Like, right. And you expect – I think you end up with a situation. It's not that people don't want to work. It's that literally who wants to work uh, – who wants to pay for the privilege of working? That, that's where it ultimately comes down to is who wants to pay for the privilege of being there? I, I, I've i never worked anywhere I wanted to pay for the privilege of being there. Now, I've done some volunteer jobs. I have done some things, you know, for free. But I can't really think of a job that I've ever paid to be there. Right. You know, I, you, that's unrealistic. Inte- intelligent people that we're told run our companies should realize no one wants to pay to be there. And I think on some level they realize that they just don't ever stop and do the math. It's a foreign concept to them because they make more than minimum right. wage that this is actually costing people money. Right. It's a novel concept. But it's a uh, very novel concept. It's a novel concept. Some of the work that's now being put in out, you know, mm-hmm. the 20, you know, and we've had this discussion. There is no reason for, you know, some people to have be in an office. There's no reason for some people to, you know, and this is what throws a lot of people is I don't work nine to five mm-hmm. or 11 to seven. You know, it's whatever, you know, my business manager, which luckily you took that over, sits down and looks at the networks and go, oh, well, this is what you should be doing. Well, yeah, we've had to have a lot of discussions about what actually works for you as well as right. what actually works financially for the business. And, right. you know, 
it, it's not going to work traditional nine to five. That's that's not going to be the bread and butter. But if you throw these hours at it, it it will work mm-hmm. very well for you. <clears throat> All right. But you know, it, it's also one of those things we sat down and did the math. And the problem a lot of people run into is you have businesses not sitting down to do the math to figure out what does it cost to get the employee with the skills that I want. What is it they're going to have to pay for in this area out of their salary? And can they afford right. to even make it? Like, if right. you're just talking about a single, unmarried, totally, you know, no children, never going to get married, never going to have children employee, would they reasonably have the skills that I'm asking for or be able to obtain them in a way to meet my hiring requirements? to work for the amount of money I'm going to set on this position. If the answer is no, you really have to step back, or you should, if anyone were doing the math, step back from that and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why am I trying to get something for nothing? Like, what what entitles me to a discount on the expense of someone else? Um just to give them a job that that doesn't work that's not reasonable and that's where we've gotten in this conversation um or the the kind of the global uh, or at least national conversation on employment is we're we're not even paying attention anymore and with a lot of employees it's not until you know they're trying to make ends meet and suddenly they're not going to meet that they actually figure out the math, if they ever figure it out. Right. Otherwise, right. they're just sitting there going, I'm a failure, I'm a screw-up, I can't do anything, you know, I can't do anything right. No, you were set up to fail. You know, yeah. you, <laughs> like if, you know, you are sitting there working for an employer that it demands a professional skill set, um, and you can't pay the student loans back? All right. There's a problem, and it's not with you. You know, right. you can sit here, and, and I've heard the side argument is, you know, it's a waste of money to get an education, and there's a lot of glee in that concept now. Of uh, mm-hmm. You know, the, the lower wages for skilled workers. Um, All right. And I'm just sitting here going, no. That's not any. That's something people should be ashamed of, not something people should be happy about. You know, right? I'm not saying that. You know, and, and let me qualify that. I'm not sitting here saying that people in a trade certification field are unskilled. Right. I, and I fully appreciate. You know, I I fully appreciate an electrician. I think electricians are wonderful. Mm-hmm. I do also balk a little at how much, um, but at the same time, you know, I get that. You're running your own business. You've got expenses. There's things going on behind right. the scenes. It's not just my stupid outlet, um, mm-hmm. you know, so you know, and you're traveling to me because I can't bring the house to you. You know, there's a lot of things going on there, mm-hmm. and that's a mindset that we have for tradespeople. But we seem to fail to have the same mindset or the, even the ability to dare to go there um, for you know, someone who has gone and worked towards a four-year degree or a master's degree or a doctorate. Um, there's very little understanding or comprehension that, you know, this concept that everyone's going to work two, three, four, five jobs to survive um, is one, ridiculous, and two, that within those jobs, none of them are actually going to be able to pay a wage relevant to the skills, training, and experience that they have as it applies to the job they're doing. Now, I bet if you go off and get a doctorate, and you go apply at, you know, McDonald's, no, McDonald's is not going to pay you for that skill set. You know, right. You know, 
I, I do not care when I get my Big Mac and fries that you can, you know, wax eloquently on, you know, the finer points of whatever your doctorate is in. Doesn't matter. Doesn't, doesn't matter. But at the same time, that doesn't mean we need to disrespect those workers who are doing fast food. I mean, that, that definitely needs right. to be a livable wage. Um, because, again, this notion that the only people flipping burgers are, you know, people who are unskilled and don't have any, you know, um, trainability and it's supposed to be high school students, it's not a career, it's unrealistic. Right. Look at the places you're, you're eating at. This mm-hmm. is not This is not high school students, folks. This is not even college students. You know, when you're sitting there talking about a waitress who's in her 50s or you're, you know, looking at the the 75-year-old behind the counter at McDonald's and you realize that's not really all that much older than, you know, the manager, the shift manager, the other employees in in there, in this restaurant, um, you have to acknowledge there's been a cultural shift. This is no longer right. some kind of, you know, like part-time summer gig for, you know, high school students. This is right. an actual job that people with, you know, rents and mortgages and utilities and car payments and health insurance and babies um, have, mm-hmm. you know. We we have totally and I think lost that connection. We need to change that perspective. Well, not only that, but we've not even we've lost that perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone seems to be doctors and lawyers. Well, sorry, someone needs to be a gardener. Someone needs to be yeah. a cook. Someone needs to be a waitress. Right. We don't even well, set our children up skills. for that. Yeah, well, we need right. skills. Otherwise, a lot of people will go freaking hungry. Um, absolutely. Um, and it's it's how a lot of people are ending up with very high level degrees and unemployability, um, and, and that's long been another issue too. The the situation is if you try to apply for a job at McDonald's and you have a doctorate or you know, mm-hmm. a master's degree, um, and I'm, I'm harping on McDonald's, it, it's any employer. Um, that has what's right. traditionally considered a, a, a cons- or what is traditionally a low wage job uh, opening. If you go in and you apply and you start listing out your you know masters and your college degrees and your, they're going to have a problem with that because they mm-hmm. fully understand you can't find anything else. You're not working here, so to speak, by choice. You're applying here as a last resort. So ultimately, right. you're waiting for something better. Like right. you, you have knowledge and skills and training and abilities. Um, mm-hmm. You're not going to get met by McDonald's. Um, right. You know, because there's only so many corporate openings. Um, you right. know, your local franchise is not going to be able to do anything for you. Um, so at what, at what and I do to an extent understand that, is at what point does the local franchise hire someone, train them, mm-hmm. and then potentially lose them the minute someone somewhere finally decides, oh, God, we need someone over here with that master's degree because you're, you're going right. to be out of there. Because presumably what you're going to make with that master's degree is going to be a heck of a lot more than McDonald's could even consider offering you. Um, And it's a no-brainer decision. You know, hi, bye, done. Yeah. Um, And But that's also one of the things that people get stuck with is if you've gone and gotten the degrees and the certifications, et cetera, et cetera, you end up in Catch-22. Um, you know, we, we like to talk about, you know, people being lazy and not wanting to apply for jobs. Um, and I went through a fair amount of that after, um, leaving my job in North Carolina is Mm -hmm. that, you know, that this, well, you know, 
McDonald's is hiring. You need to go over there and apply there. Um, you know, and I'm sitting here going, I don't have a problem working at McDonald's. Like, I, I don't care. My problem is I already know it is a waste of my time to go. Mm-hmm. You know, unfortunately, I have a bachelor's degree and five years experience. All right. So my choices are I lie on my employment application. Mm-hmm just so I get the job and pretend that, you know, I'm stupid and, you know, I just have this high school diploma and, but then it becomes a thing of, well, then what did I do for those five years after, you know, high school and, well, how did I, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because once you start Mm -hmm. doing a background check on me, there's going to be a lot of inconsistencies that suddenly have to be explained. All right. So, Lying is a bad choice because then I just have to hope they're too that they are too lazy to do a background check to call and verify right. dates of employment and references, et cetera. Um, that's what I've got to hope for if I lie at that point. Or I'm honest on it, and they sit there and they go, so if, if they so manage to do an interview, um, most places they're not even going to bother, but if – we get into that interview, I will guarantee you there will be a moment where they turn and say, so I, I'm looking at your your resume and your, you know, all of this. Why do you want to work here? All right. And again, that puts me in the position, do I lie and go, well, it's always been a dream? Because I don't think I can sell that one. Um, no. Or do I just flat out say, this is my last resort. I have bills to pay. I have things I want to do. I, you know, I need money. You have a job, and uh, I've heard that it pays money. Um, right. You know, and, and I think one that would you think, should play that. Well, but ultimately. Um, they already know before they ask the question, this is a formality at this point. They've already looked at the resume and seen it, and there's a giant neon sign hanging over my head. Mm-hmm. Gonna walk out minute something better comes along. Like, and that's gonna hope, you know, you're not gonna have any hope of keeping this one. Um, you know, they're, they're not a lifer, they're not gonna be here for any substantial amount of time generally speaking. Right. Um and they're not gonna you know, they're 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 not trying to work here. They're they're trying to work right. anywhere but here. Um right. but you know. see, that's the disdain and the takedown of, you know, him is you know, and in general we have degraded these jobs. To a point, it's ridiculous. You know, it aggravates the crap out of me mm-hmm. when you have waiters that kind of don't want to wait tables. They're just doing it because they got to pay their bills. They don't find enjoyment mm-hmm. in it. They, you know, don't care. And everyone looks down at them instead of going, oh, you're a waiter, so you've got to deal with people all day. Interesting. Yeah, no, no one finds that interesting. Uh, well, but I seriously. Did. Well, yeah, um, because it takes guilt. Well, yes, and there's a difference. Because if you're sitting there talking right. about the person who didn't want the job to start with, right? then no, it's not interesting. It's annoying. Right. Um, but you know what? It, but you know what? That waiter would be a good therapist. I've been behind that. At, you know, I tell people all the time when I go to restaurants and waiters to start making excuses. Honey, I've been behind that apron. Just bring me my coffee. You do what you got to do. I'll let you know when I need a refill. When I've got a waiter, yeah. a waitress that is actually good, that knows their job. Right. Well, but, but there's, then there's the some here that it's like, ooh. But when you're sitting here treating this, it, because ultimately what you're saying there, um, mm-hmm. uh, unless you know you, you throw some careful caveats on it, 
again, we're talking about people who did not go to college to be a waiter. Right. Um, and in that situation, that means more than likely where they're applying to work has nothing to do with skill, aptitudes, abilities, or training. Right. Um, because I do think there are people that have a natural skill, ability, and an aptitude to do food service. Right. And I think that's great. Um, and I wish their jobs paid more. Um, mm-hmm. On the flip side, that is not where my skills and abilities lie. No. Um, and when I try to do it, it's going to be a cluster mess, um, and I struggle with it. Um, because I have, you know, in the, the pre-degree days, worked at McDonald's, and it was a nightmare, um, and I hated every minute of it, and was so happy when I got a job elsewhere. Um, but, you know, I showed up, I tried, did what I could, went home every night, like, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me here. Um, you know, this is not where my talents are. Um, and I'm covered in Greece. Um, but if you, and in many ways, I think employers get that part, you know, or at mm-hmm. least from the, the flip side, you have a, a college degree in a field that has nothing to do with hospitality, food service, like culinary arts. Like, you you got nothing related to those items. Um, why do you want to work here? And it's desperation. Um, mm-hmm. And they already know you're not going to make a good employee. You're going to be gone the minute anything better comes along. Um, mm-hmm. And it's going to be a waste of their time, effort, money, and energy. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's the flip side of it is that there's going to be some people who at least show up and do their best and they are trying Mm -hmm. and they're at least good to customers. And then there's going to be people that they may interview well and beautifully, but you put them behind that counter and you're going to start losing money hand over fist. Right. Not because anything they, so to speak, intentionally do. It's not like they're stealing. It's not like they're giving stuff away. But the attitude's going to show through. There's going to be a problem. Um, right. And, again, no one wants that hassle. Right. It, it doesn't work. And they know that, right. at least on that side. Um, what they don't seem to want to admit to or deal with is that, mm-hmm. in the meantime, the people they actually right. want working there that will help them make their money actually need right. to make money working there. Right. Like that it it's short and simple. Um right. you know businesses sit here and run you know um cost analysis to figure out the pricing right. of of products. They're not right. stupid. You're not going to sit here and as anything other than a short-term promotion sell something for mm-hmm. less than what it costs to make it. Well, right. why do you in turn ask your employees to work there and make it for less than the cost to be there to make it? Right. It's pretty simple. Why would you right. ask anyone to do that? Why do you think you deserve a discount? And that's ultimately where I get stuck with this, is that, you know, we're, we're, we keep having this problem. We want a name call. We want to, you know, burger flippers and, you know, whatever. We want to keep, you know, unskilled labor, et cetera. And what we're not realizing is human with bills in a city that has a rent, you know, going right for an apartment um, mm-hmm. and cost of living. Like, they're, they're just right. flat out. You, I, you're going to have to pay them. Um, beg, borrow, or steal, you've got to come up with money to pay these costs. Right. So mm-hmm. why would you hire someone right. who either ha- can't live in the area that they serve, or that, that your business is, so they have to commute, mm-hmm. and then the cost to commute costs more than they make working there, um, or, you know, like, what, what are you thinking here? 
Like, like, help me understand. Why would you pay someone less than what it costs for them to make you money? Right. You know, because obviously you're doing the math wrong. Exactly. Oh, and yeah. a lot of doing the math wrong. Well, why don't we pay a light bill, and then when we come back, we'll discuss a few things that are kind of interesting, but at the same time, I can go, really? Just really? (laughs) Oh, goodness, this sounds fun. Oh, yeah. Do you like a little more grrrr with your coffee? Then tune in to Mountain Bears here on Blog Talk on Friday nights at 9 p.m. for the latest in LGBT topics, current events, and technology. Every Friday night, we'll be here. Join us as the Mountain Bears explore these topics and more. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. Hi. Welcome. Relax. Have a cup of your favorite topics with your host, Ace and Knight. There's nothing like a good conversation to warm your soul and give your spirit a break now and then. Ace has such a wonderful way of exploring topics like psychic phenomena, important topics in our daily lives from a psychic's point of view, and you never know who else will stop by, live on Blog Talk Radio. So come on in. We made a fresh cup of java just for you. Hi, I'm Rain. And this is Raven Wind, and we're the Feather and Bone Podcast, two witches talking about everything witchy and nothing at all. We consider ourselves to be energy-based spiritualists, non-traditionalists, and decidedly not Wiccan. Our views on magic and life in general don't align with other pagans in the community, but we have a live-and-let-live outlook on life. So if you want to learn something new while laughing a whole lot, you can find links to our podcast, Facebook page, products, and purchase tarot readings at featherandbone.net. As a busy modern woman, I'm constantly on the go. Having to make multiple stops while I'm out shopping or getting things done just doesn't work for me. That's why I love going to the Crystal Lotus Shop for every one of my metaphysical needs. They have all the basics like stones, candles, sage, plus they carry jewelry, herbs, cards, a variety of unique gifts, and several other items you're probably looking for. Uh Uh-oh, sounds like my husband's old college injury flared up again. That's okay. I can count on the team of healers at the Crystal Lotus to fix him right up. They offer massage, Reiki, Kalamni, as well as other energy modalities, all performed by licensed, highly trained, and gifted practitioners. And while he's being taken care of, I'll sit down and get some guidance by one of their accomplished psychic readers. Oh, and did I mention they do custom orders and have gift certificates as well? They even offer yoga several days a week for all levels of experience. Plus, the last Saturday of every month, they have Psychic Saturday, where they offer discounts on readings as well as many healing sessions. Stop in to meet Shauna and the rest of the family there. They're located at 89 Old Main Plaza in St. Albans, where the Loop Pharmacy used to be. Or give them a call at 304-729-8055. Crystal Lotus. Taking the spirit where the body cannot go. You're listening to the Psychic Coffee Shop Podcast Network. Choosing a psychic is hard, and you don't want to waste time finding one that's right for you. You've thought about calling into the show, but you want more privacy than that? 
With services from phone, email, chat, text, and his network availability, you need to check out ASIN's website at asinnight.com. Just a few clicks and you can have your own personal, private psychic reading. On asinnight.com, you can also find out about VIP packages, scheduling parties and events, and signing up for his classes. What are you waiting for? Talk to ASIN today. Welcome back, and, you know, check out our sponsors. Chris Loda Shop has a lot going on. Um, Feather and Bone Podcast, they always have a show coming up. They're on Podbean and a few other places. So, yeah, it will be, you know, those are good, and they're doing great. We'll probably be getting some new sponsors soon. But I thought we would talk about some things that are kind of like, oh, really? First being... Okay in general, the concentration camps that we're running. I'm sorry, that's the only thing I can call them. Well, I think it's the only thing that anyone can call them. I mean, there, there's just nothing else to call them at this point. All right. But, yeah, it, it's it, it's just sickening. Um, I, I do not understand how we can keep calling this a hard line on immigration when it has absolutely nothing to do with immigration. It has everything to do with um, harming and humiliating people um, who thought they were uh, going to be able to flee an already horrible situation. Um, I, 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 hmm. Words fail on that one. It, they right. do. It, well, it's, it's just not only that, but if these people were in Venezuela where they're freeing from, and the government was overthrown, we would be sending them aid. We would be building them water plants. We would be, you know, doing all this magical stuff for them. Well, and that's all assuming, however. Um, that we wanted anything to do with it. Because right. at this point, that's, that's on a national stage where we're at, is, you know, this this has everything to do with racism. Um, this has everything with uh, uh, believing that pe- this group of people are subhuman and not deserving of even the most basic things you would give a dog. Um, Because quite frankly, compared to the detention facilities, the most humane societies have rules for pets and animals that are better than this. Right. You know, I I don't know of many humane societies where they allow the animals to drink out of toilets. I don't know many... um, um, Humane societies that keep their animals on bare concrete floors with aluminum blankets, um, where they routinely, you know, uh, disallow animals to sleep, um, where they routinely go through and abuse animals, and, you know, management thinks it's funny in a way that these officers under stress, you know, relieve their stress. Right. That's what I'm saying. You know, a dog in a yeah. um, uh, in a pound, a humane society, whatever facility, would be treated better than this. And for anyone to sit back and say, well, this is a hard line on immigration. It will teach them not to come here. Oh, no, it doesn't. I don't think that's quite what it's going to accomplish. I, I really don't. Um, that, that's, and that's not a hard line that we need to make. That, that's, that's not even a thing. It's not, it should not. Um, I can, to some extent, see taking a hard line with adults. There's children in this situation. Um, not only that, but. There's more than just children. There's families. There's elderly. There is a reason. It's not like they're coming here just to come here for vacation and stay over. 
they're oh, escaping I war. Get that. I absolutely get that. No, I absolutely get that. And I'm, I, but I'm sitting here saying, if you're, if you're just going to call this a hard line on immigration, you know, right. uh, it's just a hard line on immigration. Um, why are you treating children like this? Why would you right. ever treat children like this? That that's where right. I go. This isn't about this. This isn't about immigration. It has nothing to do with immigration. This has everything to do with mm-hmm. racism and treating people like subhuman garbage. Because right. if you do not have a racist, prejudiced view of a group of people. Even if you disagree with the actions of an adult, you cannot, should not ever be able to bring yourself to treat children in such a way. All right. Like, after as much of this, but think of the children we've heard over the last, what are we up to, 11 years, 12 years? But what about the children? Um, if this is where we're at with that? All right. No. No, this this is right. an absolute but what about the children? When you have uh, yeah. you know, a toddler expected to um contribute to their defense for immigration proceedings. Right. How right. <laughs> it, it's ridiculous. It is. It's very ridiculous. It's very tiring. It's very nauseous. Mm-hmm. It's very mm-hmm. fucking really. Like, it is. We have, and this makes no economical sense. This makes no sense at all. Mm-hmm. We have jobs Americans will not do at all. We have people fleeing from one country to another that will work circles around people. Picking apples, picking strawberries, picking bananas, whatever. They don't have this, oh, well, that's a stupid job, or, oh, that's a job that doesn't fit my skill set. They will work. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Some of this is also just an ability to do that. Um, And -hmm. that was one of the things actually proven years ago in California during another labor shortage. Um, Mm -hmm. In which migrant labor was... uh, was there was a shortage of migrant labor. Um, the U.S. had this brilliant idea. We will pay college students and high school recent mm-hmm. grads to go and, you know, pick apples and et cetera um, to, you know, in, in response to the shortage. And the program failed miserably. Um, they sure. couldn't do it. It's not just that it's physically demanding – um, mm-hmm. In terms of the actual effort, um, it's just point blank. It's hot. Yeah. Um, and the majority of people, you, you cannot pull someone from, you know, upstate New York and throw them into sunny Southern California in an orchard mm-hmm. to pick apples all day. It, it's not going to work. Right. It doesn't work. There is an advantage in people who grow up in equator countries moving right. north. That right. that you know, it becomes a little easier. You know, it's a little bit right. cooler. It's a little less of a uh, of a problem, um, right. which does help with with um, migrant labor. Um, mm-hmm. And that's a large part of it. Um, right. But even if even if we were to just solely look at the – well, ultimately what we're saying is we're going to solely look at this as just you know migrant farm labor. It's not even that. Mm-hmm. We have a border that as much as our, our uh, president and his cohorts want to sit here and claim is all about rapists and drug dealers and uneducated welfare mooching, blah, 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 you know, I, I've – there's been a lot of, of negative uh, stereotypes painted about um, people coming from Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a whole series of issues to contend with. 
there are a right. huge number of people that were or hope, potentially still are crossing the border on a daily basis um, to get to and from work. That's it. Mm -hmm. They work on one side of the border. They live on the other side. Back and forth, Mm -hmm. back and forth, back and forth. Um, And, you know, just it it works for them, you know, one way or another, um, professionally, Mm -hmm. to live on one side of the border and work on the other. And as you tighten border security, as you start making this into a, a, a nightmare to cross the borders, um, you're severely impacting commerce. It's not just, you know, everything's made in Mexico and shipped here. That, that again, is a very, you know, simple stereotype to sit there and have. You know, it's not just, you know, factory work and um, farm work that comes across the border. All right. There's a lot of professional and technical people, especially when you're dealing with California, um, that are crossing the border on a daily basis, or at least they were. All right. Um, you know, and it's back to that concept, um, sort of like we were talking about with, um, you know, employers not wanting to uh, pay a, a wage appropriate for someone to live in an area. That's very much true right. for California. Um, you know, San Diego being just minutes across um, the border from Mexico. Mm-hmm. means that with, if you go looking for a house in San Diego, the housing you know, rent or own, housing prices are ridiculous. But well, yeah, not only are they ridiculous, mm-hmm. they aren't there. That's the whole. That's another big problem. Well, it's because we right. Like, there's a, Google employees are living in RVs because there is no home. Well, but you also run into a different scenario. Um, The people Mm -hmm. who can afford housing in those areas, Mm -hmm. a lot of them will turn around, and some of it is just because of the demands of their job or point blank, the fact they have the money to afford it, um, end up hiring help for these homes. You know, everything from housekeepers to landscapers to child care to – um, and on the lower income side, that creates its own employment bubble that mm-hmm. is very frequently in, in border states filled by people who live on one side of the border and commute to work every day because they can afford right. to live on the other side of the border. They can't <laughs> live on the U.S. side, but they can certainly right. work here. There is a plus of openings for uh, employment in those areas, um, which also stems from our national debate on um, child care, um, right. which is a dismal disaster. Um, and again, yeah, back yeah. to the concept of people not being able to work. Um, because even when you're talking about someone who's um, middle class, not that there's many people left in that category anymore, but when you start looking at middle class couples, if mm-hmm. you are in a border area, you can potentially cover that um, child care gap a whole mm-hmm. lot less expensively than some of the options you would typically have. Um, you know, because right now we're looking at, I believe it was a national average of somewhere around a thousand dollars per child um, for mm-hmm. care. You know, whether that's right. daycare, after school, you know, preschool, whatever, you're going to spend massive amounts of money for that in the U.S. with U.S. employees. However, right. if you're pulling across the border for that job. Um, with employees that can freely traverse a border without you know major issues going on there, it it allows people who would traditionally be shut out of employment to work, and many of those households, I'm sure, are it is the difference between um, being able to make it and being middle class 
and not that, you know, if one half of that couple has to stop working just to take care of the kids, all right, there's no telling how much that's going to cost them in the long run. In, right. you know, just in the ability to survive month to month, just in the ability to pay their right. mortgage month to month. So I I think it's a severe oversimplification and uh, one that's not even based in reality to sit here and just say right. we're getting the worst that Mexico has to offer coming across the border. I think we're getting probably the best that Mexico has to offer. I think that it's stupid mm-hmm. that we are a society that looks down on employees, that looks down on how, you know, that looks down on someone that says, no, I do the support, or no, I'm, you know, I make sure everything else runs so that, you know, this wild, you know, career my partner's in can flourish. Mm -hmm. I think that's more BS and bullshit than amounted. I think, you know, jobs like housewife and everything else, um, You know, you just let it be. You let it relax. Well, but ultimately, over the last, and I, I would honestly say the last thirty years, um, right. we have at least in the again in the national debate um, mm-hmm. seen a lot of negativity thrown around, mostly because right. you end up having to justify. Right. And there, there's this ultimate feeling that if you're at least doing better than your neighbor, mm-hmm. then it's okay. That even right. if things suck for you, if you're doing better than the trash across the street, mm-hmm. then you're okay. Or, you know, and I think that's how we've grown to look at it, is that right. there is, at least at this point, so much suffering going on that we're taking solace in our ability to beat each other down. So mm-hmm. it's it becomes a competition. Right. That it has nothing to do with, hey, you're doing okay, life's pretty good, you know, you got a car in the driveway, and, you know, the, light, the bills are paid, and, you know, mm-hmm. awesome, that's great. Um, you know, and you... you can manage to swing that on, say, one income or, you know, however that occurs. Um, All right. You know, and, okay, well, that's awesome. I'm, you know, and this is what, you know, I'm doing. And this is how we make it work. And, you know, that's awesome, too. Instead, we have grown into this society that, wants to sit here and trash others for the choices that they make and when they make them and how they make them um, right. and just kind of run with this theory that as l- and a lot of that again goes back to suffering and struggle that it's easier right. to sit here and go you know, and throw off on others you know, the stupid housewife and, you know, she's just with him for the money and, um, you know, that kind of concept is a lot easier to swallow than, yeah, we're all getting screwed. We are literally all getting screwed. Um, you know, the, the, you know, your five cents more than someone else still doesn't mean Jack. Right. You know, because that's that's usually a lot of, at least within employment, where you see that kind of bravado is, mm-hmm. you know, people making five cents more than someone else are, are hanging on to that five cents. Right. Like, it is everything in the universe. And it's like, but if you still can't afford to live, right. you ain't any better than I am. Like, right. Where where did you get the entitlement here? That that if you right. make five cents more of nothing, mm-hmm. that you're doing better than I am. Um, right. You're not. 
you are absolutely not. Like, and but that's the narrative that we've been given now. Is mm-hmm. and a lot of that has to do with the with the decline of the middle class and the massive gap between you know poverty and privilege that exists now. Um, you know that that there's this in instead of fighting together, we're all fighting each other, um, which right. kind of mirrors the privilege side of it, in which they're just fighting for more. You know, more in bragging rights. Um, the fact that we're reflecting that on the the poverty side, um, which is right. a whole different topic, but it's it's actually interesting the number of people who do not realize they are poor, and if you try right. to explain that to them, they will fight you tooth and nail. That right. is how much we have tied people's identity to income their entire mm-hmm. concept of worth and value to their their income and earnings that just right. simply pointing out to someone that you're basically poor like you yeah. know you're not rich you 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 are not independently wealthy you do not have you know limitless means or seemingly limitless right. means to go do whatever you want you, you shit right. If you're living paycheck to paycheck, you're poor. Mm-hmm. Right. That's it. Don't care what the number is. If you are mm-hmm. living paycheck to paycheck, if you are unable to meet an emergency situation um, mm-hmm. and respond to it by you know, effectively writing a check, and I mean things like you know, an unexpected health care bill or an unexpected trip or – you know, an unexpected car repair, things like that. Um, All right. If you, and and that's a drastic change, by the way. It used to be, the the conversation used to be around um, a concept known as uh, fiscal responsibility, in which you were mm-hmm. supposed to be able to float yourself for six months without income. That was right. the goal. That was the gold standard. That was middle class, is that if mm-hmm. you were, for whatever reason, unable to receive income for six months, mm-hmm. you could meet all of your obligations. You know, you weren't going to lose anything. Right. Six months, you know, you could bounce back. We're not even there right. anymore. Um, right. Now we're simply looking at the huge number of people that cannot – have a car break down and handle it. Like, all right, that car has to be towed, and there's a $500 repair bill on top of it, you know, hitting that, like, $700, $800 number? Uh Uh-uh, not going to happen. And, you know, this isn't just people who work part-time. These are full-time employees. And many of them are wage uh, employee or um, sorry, salary employees, not wage employees. All right. Um, All right. And that's the biggest sign that, to me, that we have a massive mm-hmm. problem in understanding what poverty is. That we have not adjusted for inflation. We have not paid any attention to what what poverty is today. Um, mm-hmm. But we, but companies and um, you know, politicians have made a massive effort to make sure mm-hmm. that we know who to blame, and it's not them. Right. It's the guy that's making five cents less than you. It's the guy who's not the same race as you. It's the guy who's not, you know, a guy. Right. Um, you know, whatever. Whatever you've got to do there, um, to like, that's the new trickle-down e- economics. That's how that works. It's a trickle down of blame, not a triple trickle down of money. The money's not going to show up. It, no, it hasn't. Not, but since... here's... Yeah. yeah. But here's the thing. And it aggravates the crap out of me when I see people do it and deal with it and have to deal with it. You want to, mm-hmm. I just want to walk up and slap them. When they get that look, when someone says, well, you know, I work from home. 
Oh, uh, so do you sell Avon? No. Or, oh, I'm a stay-at-home dad, or I'm a stay-at-home husband, or I'm a stay-at-home wife. Oh, well, that must be so bad for you. Are you looking for work? I want to, like, jab slap the living fuck. Or, or, or there's the inverse of that. Uh-huh. Oh, well, it must be nice not to have to work for a living. Uh-huh. Like, I'm sorry. And I'll throw it out here. Come be my partner for a week. Come be my partner for a week. Yeah. I'll show you everything that they have to put up with, go through, deal with, on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and you know, and, and then try to add in your own career. Um, you yeah. Know, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, good luck with that. Yeah. Because it, it does. There. Well, and that's true for a lot of people, especially anymore. Um, and right. especially in a digital age, um, mm-hmm. because right now, you know, what you needed professionally 10 years ago, right, you could totally handle, like, you, everything you needed to do for your employment to make money, as long as you had a computer and a phone line of some variety, Mm-hmm. And the power stayed on, and the internet continued to function. You right. were effectively self-sufficient. It was all yeah. self-contained. Um, mm-hmm. What you needed five years ago, predominantly, I'm sure, self-contained, but getting a little stressful. Right. And within the last year, it's gotten to the point that... It's not just it, like there's now like five jobs related to it. Right. You know, there, there's a PR manager, there's a business manager, there is a, you know, like to in order to do this effectively, you need to be right. skilled at marketing, you need to be skilled at, you know, creating ads and you know, making sure that, you know, you send all kinds of correspondence and being able to update this and update that and update this other thing for the different sites that you're on. All of them want professional right. photography for your headshots. All of them want, you know, this, that, and something else. Um, and now these sites are throwing even more of the things um, that, that they used to do. That, well, either that they used to do or they didn't particularly concern themselves with. Like, I was trying to find right. the right wording for that. You know, like like now you have the one network that's throwing off its uh, search engine optimization on all of its agents. Mm-hmm. Um, what the heck? That That is a corporate function. Like, Right. I don't know how they think, what, 2,000-some-odd advisors on that network? 2,500, 2, maybe 2,600 now. They open new yeah. positions. But here's the thing with that. If we go back to PRN, the original network, yes, I worked with Virginia, a.k.a. Miss Cleo. She was a lovely lady when I was out here on commercial. We would do conferences. We'd fly, you know, they'd fly us off to Atlanta. Boom. You know, we've got, we're talking to the marketing team. I'm doing training classes to the ones that, you know, haven't read tarot before. We're talking professional behavior. That, you know, a week conference. Boom. Uh, California mm-hmm. Psychics also done the same thing. They brought, they bring all the readers together. They do this massive conference. We get everything all sorted out. And then they go back and do their job because they're the network. Right. That's no longer the case. You know, if we even know people that we work with, it's because we've encountered them somewhere else. Yeah. And even when you're trying to have those conversations, because they're still having webinars. Um, at least the yeah, they're having webinars is. now. All of them are. Webinars, um, emails. And, it's like, yeah. But they're not conversations. 
they're they're just no. we're dumping out legally required information so you don't throw pitchforks at us. Um right. you know, later. Um and, and that's basically it. It's not a conversation. They're not engaging. They're not trying to get feedback or information or talk to people who who have done the job um and right. get, you know, kind of a consensus and an understanding. There's effectively no one driving this that actually understands um, right. what Business. your job is we're no longer what home. you're already doing. You know, right. because this no, is – yeah, it's armchair quarterbacking on the whole thing. Um, you you have people that may be experts in business and, and have business degrees – and maybe experts in computer systems and databases and have a very you know fluent understanding of you know customer relationship management you know CRM got to love it um mm-hmm. but at the end of the day don't seem to be understanding that they're offloading a tremendous amount of requirements onto the people that are working for them and then asking for more money to do it, um, you know, in in fees um, from their uh, um, advisors, but then also turning Mm -hmm. around and really not understanding that for you to expertly do everything that they're requiring or that they're asking Mm -hmm. for um, Mm -hmm. means that for about every hour – that you work for them, you're going to mm-hmm. put in another 15 to 20 minutes on keeping up their records right. um, and doing the things that they want you to do and generating graphics and creating tweets and creating Facebook posts and creating, creating, creating. Um, right. And there comes a point when it's like, did, did someone do the back of envelope math on this? Like that's going to be a lot of time that you you, right. you are really going to struggle there. That if <laughs> you're spending, um, that that one of two things are effectively going to happen. That either right. you're going to reduce your work time by twenty five percent so that mm-hmm. you can use the other twenty five percent to do what they're asking, or you're going to end up working more. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately to what end? Because it's going to effectively right. be uncompensated. Uh, you know, you're not going to pay for it. Um, yeah. And h- how do they expect that to work? You know, again, um, and this is kind of the refrain for the evening, it's yet another example of the problems we're running in with companies that keep expecting more and more for less and less, or more aptly, don't think they should have to pay or that they should get some kind of discount just for mm-hmm. showing up and giving you a right. you know the opportunity to work. And it's like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're making money too. Well, not you only know. that, but what they not get, and this is what happens. We've seen it with movies. You know, to quote Betty Davis, mm-hmm. oil companies are owning us. You know, um, can you imagine old MGM and the amount of movies? I mean, what is that movie that we both watched with Betty in it? Oh, narrow it down. There's a lot of Betty Davis movies. The one that you're always quoting and, you know, she... Um, and attacking people and, you know, telling them how to get off. Starts with a D. It's in my YouTube history, but, of course, I can't look and see what it is. The first movie I sat and watched as soon as you mentioned it. It's not the damn Don't Cry, is it? No, it's the other one. Starts with a D. Starts with a D. Yeah, this is one of your clues, and hence it's probably one of the other 26 letters in the alphabet. It's a Western. 
She's running an oil company. Anyhow, they made that movie in three weeks flat. From here's the script to post production. She made six twenty five six hundred and twenty five dollars a week. Mm-hmm. We've got movies that have been in production for two years. The actors are getting paid way more than they used to. Mm-hmm. But the quality ain't there. It's the same damn story. Oh, um, yeah. Well, yeah. and there's a but difference. My point, there's a huge difference. Um, mm-hmm. And now, okay, so the techie is going to go, you're going to think that the next words are going to be, but CGI. Nope, not even going there. Not even going there. Yeah. Forget CGI. CGI is a tool. CGI is wonderful. CGI can do many things. It can also screw up a lot. But in terms of film production, when you're looking mm-hmm. at early film production, which is kind of where you know the, the, the quote-unquote golden age of Hollywood came from, mm-hmm. everything was new. Everything was experimental. Everything was a learning process, and, you know, maybe it's not going to be perfect, but what else do you got to compare it to? I mean, if right. you're sitting here today looking back at a Charlie Chaplin film, that crap looks nasty. Like, who the, like I could do better with a, like, you know, selfie stick and a flipping, you know, camera phone from the 90s. Like, my God. Oh, and it was a Blair Witch Project. You know, effectively. Um, but And that actually still looks better than an old Charlie right. Chaplin film because it's all experimental. Mm-hmm. All of it was new. All of it was new technology. All of it was a new concept. No one knew what was going to work and what wouldn't. They didn't know what would sell or interest. It was all an experiment. You know, throwing right. spaghetti at a wall to see what would stick. So now we have a problem. Right. They figured out what would stick. They they right. figured out what would sell. They figured out what audiences wanted by demographic groups. They figured out a formulaic way to predict would a story sell an audience? Would a movie be seen? And it's mm-hmm. a very low-risk kind of thing now. So, yeah, you right. end up with a lot of repeated storylines and remakes of movies of remakes of movies. You know, right. how many Titanics did we need? Um, you know, how many versions of these movies do we need? Ultimately all being um, based on the premise um, that this movie already sold. We know it's going to sell. So make right. it again. Or tell the story a little bit different. But we know the formula. We know the formula. <laughs> right. And we end up sitting here going, I feel like I've seen this before. Like, well, it's I like, I've seen this that movie. movie just turned off the other well, night. Yeah. We had sat down, we're going to watch a movie, we're going to enjoy a movie. Yeah. That one was, now that was slightly different. Um, one, I would have, okay, so I'm I'm kind of a horror whore. Um, and that is H O R R O R horror W H O R E. I love my horror movies. I do. I love them dearly. I will even watch bad horror movies, like Bloody Bloody Bible Camp, with starring Ron Jeremy. I have watched it. I thought it was great. Um, you know, it's a cheesy bad horror movie, but it's still good. Um, I will watch that junk. I, I will watch movies that poke fun at horror movies. I enjoy them. Um, mm-hmm. What I have a problem with is when a movie tries to be serious, and then mm-hmm. they screw it up. And that's right. what that movie is doing. Is I don't know if I, like, and I didn't even go research it afterwards. Like once we turned it off, I was so done. Um, because I'm just sitting here getting angrier by the minute because this looked like crap. Someone picked up their, you know, uh, a camera at Walmart and went and shot with, you know, like a couple of, you know, students, uh, or a few students, um, 
and just didn't think it through. They didn't really plan. They didn't have anyone sitting there going, wait a minute, <laughs> you, you got a little transitional problem here. Like, did, did you watch the movie after you made the movie? Because you got some issues going on. And we were like, what, 20 minutes in, if we got that far? Um, we I was finally ready to, to um, go Right. Uh, we were close to a half hour because it was enough that I couldn't start another movie. Right. And I was I was just about to go through the roof um, because we hit this part in the scene where this one character, you know, and of course, scantily clad blonde going to investigate the weird sound, um, gets out of bed, appeared to walk out of the room barefoot. Then suddenly has Ugg boots on, and a, you know, and she's wandered through the kitchen and picked up a knife. And okay, I, I'm like, all right, you know, I can explain that. You know, I'm I'm good, I'm good, I can work this. And then next thing you know, the knife is gone. Like she doesn't have pockets. I don't know where the knife went. But now she suddenly has a flashlight. She has a pad. Don't know where the flashlight came from. Then all of a sudden, the flashlight's gone, but the knife's back. I'm sitting here going, this seems like a really haphazard house right here. If there's just random knives and, you know, is this the Dead by Daylight house? Like, we just have knives. Like, is that how we're supposed to live? Did someone forget to tell me this? Like, is this a new rule? Like, I thought the knives were in the knife block and the, the flashlights were in a drawer, you know. And it was going to be obvious if the girl wearing underwear and a T-shirt is carrying a knife and a flashlight. Right. right. And that's where, I, like, my brain just started to go, okay, I, I can't take anymore. Like, I can handle they took the license plates off the car because I couldn't figure out how to do a shot without the rear end of the car in it. You know, I've sat here and, like, been, like, just dismissing things and going low budget, low budget, obviously low budget. It's okay. It'll be okay. This one actress is really annoying me because she has no depth. But okay, I, I'll maybe it's part of her character. I don't know. And then right. it got to that one scene, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. This is garbage. Like, this is, right. you know. And part of me wants to sit here and, and go, okay, they were throwing spaghetti at a wall, but I know that's not what it is. Um, this is well, someone, And they made two of them. That was the shocker. Yeah, that was my point. Shocker is finding out there's two. Yeah. Right. My point being, we have people in industries, in executive positions, that have not a damn clue. Goldfish yeah. had a damn clue. When he ran PCS, other than stupid floor techs not knowing what to do, not following the what was decided in the marketing meeting, that company mm-hmm. took care of their psychics. They don't anymore. That you know, where a dime a dozen, they can train a chimpanzee to do the job. Yeah. But, you know, it's very difficult for someone in my position. But an executive, oh, Lord, someone that has to go places and travel and all that, when the hell are you supposed to have time to, you know, be with your family, have a conversation, say more things than pick up milk? No wonder our divorce yeah. rates up the fucking zoo. Well, yeah, and then you also turn around and you have people that um, actually do work their way up to positions. Um, happened mm-hmm. to a friend of mine, works for a pretty well-known bank. Um, he made it up to a VP position and had been doing it for years. Mm-hmm. Um, ends up, his company comes to him and says, um, you know, one, we can't pay you anymore because you don't have the college degree to back up your position title. And then turns uh-huh. around and says, oh, well, actually, we're going to take away your position because you shouldn't be in that position without a college degree. Right. Um, and he's sitting here going, I travel all over the East Coast. You not only want me to get a bachelor's degree, you also want me to turn around and get a master's degree so I can keep doing the job I've already demonstrated I'm properly doing for you. Right. 
Like, can you run that through your head? Like, I have worked every single position this company has. There is nothing about this company I don't know and understand. But because I didn't go to college and I didn't get the degree, Mm -hmm. you're perfectly happy with this Chad over here who knows nothing about your business, who doesn't know anyone in the business, who has been here for five minutes making, Mm -hmm. you know, twice what I do um, and, you know, giving you ideas supposedly for how to run your business um, based on whatever, you know, program he went through for business college um, or Mm -hmm. for a degree, um, and that's what they told him he's supposed to think, you know, because he just fell out of college five minutes ago and has no experience in the field, um, that's the employee you want. Um, So, you know, and and I know that's a little counter to my previous argument. Um, I've had a belief that there are people that can work from their way from the bottom up, and that is what uh, this friend of mine did. You know, he got hired at an entry-level position probably 20-some years ago and worked his way up. But, Mm -hmm. you know, to then turn around and not only is he, you know, really good at his job, um, he's really well-liked and respected at his job, um, he has mm-hmm. made the company money hand over fist and been part of some very wonderful projects um, that made them mm-hmm. even more money. Um, and, you know, he's constantly on the road and traveling and never home. Mm-hmm. To then be told, thanks, but, you know, we want someone who doesn't know what they're doing to tell us how to do it. And right. unless you go get the degree that they have, um, you, not only can we not pay you more, you know, i.e., we're going to keep you at a low pay scale. Um, no one else in this position is is going to be making less than you. Actually, there's going to be people lower than you making more than you. Um, mm-hmm. But we're also going to then turn around and take your job away. Right. The, well, that's the reason I'm not IT anymore. Yeah. Point blank, the reason I'm not IT anymore. Right. Well, now, the David, David and Goliath aspects of this story being what they are, the, the wonderful mm-hmm. pushback to this is they did let him go. Mm-hmm. I think he was gone maybe three or four months, and they pulled him back and said, we don't know what we mm-hmm. were thinking. Help. Please help. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're now in trouble. We we you know have been listening to these people who have no experience with business, who don't understand the product lines. Uh, we can't find anyone who will travel as much as you do. Uh, um, here's money. <laughs> you right. know, forget that requirements thing. Like, n- 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 not important. Not important anymore. Not important. Um, so right. you know, that was the nice ending to the story. Um, but it's still, it, it's one of those things that when, you, like, part one of it is, did someone ever listen to themselves as they went to give him the speech? Like, dude's making you money. Dude knows what he's talking about. Dude works mm-hmm. his butt off. Dude is never home. Why are you going to upset this apple cart? Like, right. throw the guy a few extra bucks an hour or, you know, a couple grand a year. I think that was basically all he ever asked for, was just bump me mm-hmm. up a little bit here. You know, I'm doing a lot right. of travel. I'm, you know, I got bills to pay. Um, and that's all he's asking for. And instead of going, wow, we really appreciate everything you've done and are doing and all the money you've made us, um, no, screw you. I, it just it boggles boggles the right. mind. You know, mm-hmm. like, why would you do that? Like, why? Right. And it's because they think they need a degree. Sorry. I've seen people come out of college and they're as dumb as a damn box of rocks. Some of well, the stuff they come up with 
like, what planet are you from? That doesn't work here. Well, and there are there there are situations one runs into in which, mm-hmm. yes, you definitely need to listen to that person that's been there for 40 years and, and mm-hmm. have an appreciation for what they've experienced and what they've done and what they've been through and the challenges the business has faced that you know nothing about. Part right. one of that is there aren't that many people that have been there for 40 years left. Most of them are either retired or about to get fired is the way right. it feels anymore. Um, you know, experience is gone. You know, the the new concept of employment is if you're not moving in three to four years, then mm-hmm. you're not worth anything. You know, you're you're right. stagnant, you're dead, you're useless, you're worthless. Um, you know, that's it. Um, that that's you know, there's no retirement from a company unless you want to ride a desk and work a dead-end job for no more pay than when you started. Um, And even then, that's not a guarantee. Um, But, no, I do have absolute appreciation for the fact that, yeah, there's things that as a new employee or as a new college graduate that you don't know about that business. Totally get that. Um, I don't think that makes those people totally useless. Um, you know, new insights, fresh ideas, fresh approaches, you know, better timing, whatever. You can find a lot of mm-hmm. skill sets there um, that may take an old idea, make it better, and get it to work. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it, And that's where the advantages of past mistakes comes along, is explain to me right. what failed, what actually happened, what went wrong. Is it an actual bad idea? Or, you know, was it a bad idea because Jim in accounting is banging Mark's wife and he found out and the project went to hell? Yeah. Like, right. or, what's the problem? Well, here's a good example. Here's a great example. This new CRM system. Uh-huh. You know, send them, you know, a note in two weeks to follow up on your reading. Uh huh. I have done over ten thousand readings last month. Mm-hmm. What the heck? I would be sending emails for days. Well, yeah, especially if it's got to sit there and be a personalized email, because that was actually yeah. the request they made. They wanted a personalized email. And I'm sitting here going, how personalized do you want the form letter? Because you can't, you don't have time for this crap shit. You know. I mean, I'm sorry. How personalized do you want the form letter? Because when you're talking about a thousand readings, or ten thousand readings, or however many thousand readings, there's, you know, if you turn that, if it takes you one minute to type an email, that's another thousand minutes. Are you kidding me? It's a form letter. You're mm-hmm. getting a form letter. There's no way you're not getting a form letter. Now, we exactly. can try to make it sound personalized as much as we can, but their mm-hmm. thought and theory that you're going to kind of regurgitate a little bit of this call into every single email, not going to happen, not going to fly. Right. Um, and three of our clients don't want that. Well, no, and in many cases that's a privacy issue, but – even yeah. even then, um, that's not exactly what CRM is. Um, that that wasn't supposed to be like. That's my problem with CRM is when people use it poorly. Um, right. One, it, it's meant for um, organizations in which a lot of hands are going to be you know around the pot. Where, you know, it's not just one chef working the pot, going to cut up all his own vegetables, you know, do all of our own stuff, and follow this dish from fresh ingredient all the way to table. Um, you know, or the equivalent thereof um, within the business environment. You know, when you have a marketing team and a sales team and a client relations team and a 
you know, a product support team and an executive team and an accounting team and all these different divisions of company are going to have to handle their specific functions with this client. Um, that's where CRM comes into play. That's how you manage that conversation so that when that customer calls in and talks to someone new or someone different, that someone new or different has a clue what the hell's going on and maybe why they're calling. Because right. a lot of business conversations end up happening at sides. Um, you know, that the salesperson reaches out to their to the client they brought on and that client throws a temper tantrum because, you know, the billing's screwed up or you're not doing what we told you we were told you would do. Um, whatever. Okay, so that salesperson, if they're any good at their job or you know, have an appreciation for what they're supposed to be doing is going to turn around and go and reach out to the appropriate divisions within that company and go, hey, we got a problem over here. You need to right. fix it. Go talk to this person. Go, go email them at least. Find out what's going on specifically so that we can resolve this and you know, repair this relationship. That's right. the goal is this mm -hmm. person who's contacting your business is supposed to feel like they're talking to the same person over and over right. and over again. That it's all a, you know, w it's all one unified experience. That, you know, who they right. are and who they're with and what they're calling about and what their, you know, vague issue is. So you can start drilling mm -hmm. it down to get to what the problem is. Um, right. That's generally where CRM works best. Um Right. Trying to apply this to networks and psychic readings and tarot readings and you know the things that that network does. Um, right. Ultimately, the only way that you would want to do that um, is either you don't understand what it's supposed to do and you're thinking it's just cool buzzwords and you want to go with that, um, or you don't recognize the time commitment required for this, and you think that someone managing a thousand clients or more a month is going to have time for this shit, or right, or and most importantly, um, you're trying to make all of the advisors on this site ubiquitous. So it doesn't matter that the client develops a relationship with a particular person. You want any and every single one of your advisors to be able to pick up where that last advisor left off and then think, you know, mm -hmm. it's all the same person. Or, or at least have a, a talking to one person kind of experience. At which point, you become a dime a dozen. Now, would potentially the, uh, you know, the client side of this improve? Maybe. Or maybe a crappy advisor just sits there, looks at the notes on the account that someone who knows what they're doing created, and they can wing it. Right. And the next advisor can wing it off of the last notes. Um, either which way, it ends up becoming potentially becoming a justification to pay all of you less. Because now you don't have to have any right. skill or ability. Just read the damn notes. You know, right. she wants to hear that her husband's not cheating on her. Don't talk about, you know, her cat. Um, you know, whatever. Right. No. There's a lot of disingenuity uh, uh, to that as far as I'm uh, right. concerned. Um, is that, you know, you're, you're not caring about the client you, so much as you're caring about their money and giving them right. the illusion of an experience or the illusion of a benefit that doesn't actually exist. You're not letting your advisors sink or swim based on their abilities, their skills, and, you know, whatever, and build a relationship with the client. Um, 
you're making them a dime a dozen and you're treating them like, you know, this is just tech support. You know, Sorry. human tech support. Um, that's not what you do. That's not what the client has generally wanted. So why are you doing it unless you just have an end goal of paying everyone less? Um, right. And we've kind of had that back and forth in the house um, conversation is I can't find any other scenario to run it through except that last one that makes any logical right. business sense. Why are you investing time, effort, energy, and money to pushing the CRM concept if your end goal is not to go treat mm -hmm. all of your advisors like, you know, they're dime a dozen widgets? Um, well, you know. Here's the thing, and this is what I'm suspecting it is, and what I'm going on with is that they are doing this so because they don't understand our business. Well, no, they don't. I mean, that's obvious, obvious, no matter how okay. you slice that. What they obviously understand is that we talk to people on the phone or the chat or the video. That's what they understand. They don't get the metaphysical side of it. They don't get the personal interaction side of it. All they do is they see us as call center workers. So they're trying to give us the yeah. tools that you give a call center worker. And me and you have had this discussion a lot of times that this is bullshit. We're not doing it. Right. Well, uh, to to a degree, no. Now, I, right. do I uh, like to an extent? I agree with having some personal sounding, you know, emails going out. I, I can get that. I can get behind that. That's a cool idea. We can use that. Let's do that. Do sure. we need to sit there and be like, you know, Jane? I, you know, I really, you know, felt for you during our call yesterday about your situation with your husband, and, you know, I'm here for you anytime you need me. Just feel free to call, and, you know, hopefully this will all take care of itself soon. You know, best wishes, ace it. Yeah, and then do that kind of level of interaction for every single client? No. No, no, no. Um, yeah. Uh, uh. One, I don't think any of your clients are going to appreciate this. I don't think any client ought to appreciate this. Um, right. Two, um, they're not really giving you the tools to do it. Like that's the other issue we've run across in trying to talk about this, is that they're putting requirements out there but not giving you the tools to implement them. Um, right. You know, that it's like, go develop your own CRM system on your own to track all this mm -hmm. data and then turn around and manually feed all of that information back into our system so that you can meet the goals that we've set up for you. All right. And that's where I have to take a stand and go, no. I need like yeah. five fucking team members behind me. And, you know, and, you know I'll. We right. said it very poignantly, it ain't going to happen. Um, no, it can't. It literally can't. Um, right. One, because of the point in which you need five people to help you do this job on a normal daily basis, um, each client's going to have to cough up a hell of a lot more per minute just to right. pay for it. You know, right. I like... I can work only so many hours until we're going to have to hire a few people. Um, you yep. know, and that's just reality. Uh, you can only work so many hours right before up. you have to hire people to do stuff. I mean, hi, right. we now have someone coming every two weeks to mow the yard. Um, and I will almost directly point a finger at one of the networks and say this is their fault. Yeah. Um, if not a couple of the networks. That as they're asking for more and they're not compensating mm -hmm. for it, and in fact they're raising their fees again, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then throwing more requirements on top of it, um, mm -hmm. and haven't really specced out what this would look like in reality, 
um, mm-hmm. it, it's it has pulled you more into needing mm-hmm. you know to spend more time with them and more time on them um, and away from things that you would ordinarily have no problem with doing that you want to do that you would like to be doing. Um, right. You know, it, it's no longer a thing of show up, do your job, and go home. You know, granted, you work from home, nope. but still, you know what I mean. You know, leave the desk. Yeah, walk to the dining room, do some work. Yeah. Well, so we'll actually talk about a little bit more because I'm going to delve into working from home. Next show. Mm-hmm. So until then, good night, y'all. You have a lovely evening, and we'll talk to you next week. Good night. Choosing a psychic is hard, and you don't want to waste time finding one that's right for you. You've thought about calling into the show, but you want more privacy than that? With services from phone, email, chat, text, and his network availability, you need to check out Asen's website at asennight.com. Just a few clicks and you can have your own personal, private psychic reading. On asennight.com, you can also find out about VIP packages, scheduling parties and events, and signing up for his classes. What are you waiting for? Talk to Asen today. You're listening to the Psychic Coffee Shop Podcast Network.